I need to start. Uh, yeah. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. It's two o'clock. We'll start our meeting. Uh, I want, first of all, welcome you all and tell you that we're doing this <clears throat> virtually, so you'll have to bear with us as we work through some technical issues. I have my Cracker Jack team here. Tara is keeping me straight and making sure all this is working as it should. First of all, uh, let me say that uh, we're sorry that Pat Gardner is no longer with us, that you know Pat didn't come back, but we're certainly glad to see that uh, Debbie Butner is gonna be spending some time with us. So Debbie, welcome and uh, glad that you're here. Uh, what we thought we would do is we'll go through our presenters, let them make their presentation. And if you want to ask a question, hold your question until they finish and then we'll come back and, and recognize you so that you can ask them any questions that you may have. So what we'll do is be, uh, we'll start with our presenters and our first uh, presenter will be Dr. Timmy with the Department of Public Health. So Dr. Timmy, are you with us? Um, was that? We oh, we're good. okay. We're good. Yes. I see you, Dr. Timmy. Yes. Hey, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate being here with you today. And thanks for uh, all that everyone is doing to help support our, our COVID efforts. Uh, and a shout out to my other um, my other departments on the, on the call with us, like DCH, who have been working closely with us on so many of the things we're doing. I know that I, um, I as you well know, uh, once I start talking about COVID and our response, I can easily talk for two hours. And given that, I'm going to focus on the budget and then leave time for some COVID discussion, maybe immediately after uh, I finish because I have a press conference I need to um, go to as well. Um, so I, I hope that that's acceptable to you Chairman, um, just simply because um, of, of the timing this afternoon. Uh, the first slide, uh, are you controlling the slide? Yeah, it's on, it's on the map. I don't know okay. Can you all see the slide? Can you all see the slide? I, I do not see it now. It was up a minute ago. So why don't I, I why don't I start just in the interest of time and, and is there um uh, yeah. to get the um the uh, yeah, okay, uh, then we got, then we got slides. I, I'm, I'm actually going to use many of the same uh, PowerPoints that I used for the joint presentation, um, but we'll start uh, just with a quick overview that public health is an unusual uh, agency in the way it's structured. Um, our state office has about 1,000 or 1,200 staff. Uh, then we have 18 public health districts uh, around that, uh, that, that are divided around the state. And within the districts are 159 county boards of health. And uh, I'm just pleased that uh, last night, the Fulton County Commission actually uh, voted to allow Fulton Board of Health actually to join us as a full-fledged board of health, which is something we have been working on since Representative Jones introduced that, uh, gee, it must have been 2015, 16, 17. So um, truly 159 county boards of health working in partnership with our public health districts with the health directors in a dual role reporting directly to me, but also reporting as CEOs to the boards of health. And our, our, our mission of course is to serve all Georgians um, throughout the state, um, across all sectors of, of health and well-being. Uh, our, our full deployment 
really for the, since January of last year has been largely to COVID response. Uh, initially, a, a, a ramp up of quarantine efforts and identifying individuals um, in the community, largely through travel related COVID, but then actually increasing testing and going statewide. Um, with our, our testing and pre other prevention efforts, contact tracing, and, and now um, the vaccine campaign. I'll talk in, in greater detail about the vaccine campaign after going over the, the uh, 2021 budget. Uh, again, just in the recognition that um, I know your questions and just my uh, personal engagement in this is such that I could um, talk for several hours. And, and just to say that, it, I, I hope that we can schedule perhaps a webinar or some other uh, joint session, because I know there are so many questions and, and your constituents are contacting you about vaccine and, and the situation is changing daily, um, even as a new administration is coming in with new plans. And so I think uh, uh, webinars to update everyone um, as we progress through this changing environment it will be helpful for all of us. Let me just start with the governor's budget recommendation for 2021. Um, the first item is for the Grady Regional Coordinating Center. I don't know if you re remember how this first came into being. Uh, a large pipe burst in, at Grady and, and uh, required a significant amount of diversion away from Grady because of lack of available bed space. And we had a number of individuals, including our own staff uh, from EMS, in what became a coordinating center to divert um, EMS providers to other hospital facilities where there uh, was available uh, space. And we recognized that this was really a positive asset to the broader metro area, not just during this crisis, this Grady crisis, but potentially at all times because of, of the needs of hospitals vary and hospital bed capacity may vary, whether it be uh, because of COVID currently or because of a mass casualty event or some other situation. And so uh, it was with your interest in this and, and support, I, I'm, I'm grateful that the this coordinating center was actually codified into law. What the $289,000 does is actually uh, completes the funding for this fiscal year and will allow that to continue. It's, it's had a tremendous impact during uh, co the COVID response and will continue uh, as we go forward in the years to come. And this will allow us to have some additional staff capacity to support that and for it to um, maintain the good work it's doing. Uh, the Infant and Child Essential Health Treatment Services, um, there's some savings that you'll see, 289,000 that's due to um, EF map uh, because of the COVID emergency, there was a change in our our uh, our Medicaid match, and so we were able to get some additional dollars back and some savings. Um, so that's what that uh, two hundred eighty-nine thousand um, savings so plus is. And you'll see also the infectious disease control, uh, an additional request for one hundred forty-four thousand. 26. Um, in last year's budget, uh, there were a number of positions uh, taken in, in a reduction, and inadvertently, these positions were also included. They weren't intended to be as part of that, but they were included. And these are in the HIV, TB, SCD program. They are needed for the continuation of our of that work. And so we just asked that what, what was ever intended to be cut was put back, reduced, and was put back in. And that's what you see there. Can you see this, the PowerPoint now, Chairman? Yes, we can see that. Oh, oh good. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, I know that what's on everybody's mind is what um, state dollars have you gotten for what has been the, the this enormous COVID response? 
um, we are, have not been using state dollars and in fact have been exclusively using federal dollars. Um, and what you see on the next slide, which is different than what was um, presented earlier in the week because it breaks it out more completely. Um, we were allowed to use a, a, a small amount of, of COVID relief funds, about 37 million, which sounds like a lot, but it's not when you actually are doing the kind of activities we're doing, including laboratory testing and having to contract for those laboratory tests. The epidemic, uh, and that, that of course went directly to OPB from Treasury. The other uh, federal grants actually were funded was funding that came directly to us uh, from CDC. And so the Epi and Lab Capacity CARES One um, began in 4-23-20. Um, and that the intent of that was to do our COVID activities, including increased surveillance. And uh, that started shortly after we began to see our first cases in March. Um, and we that along with the additional CARES 2 and CARES 3, which are all epi and lab capacity, epidemiology and lab capacity CDC funds are either currently being used uh, or will soon be used. Uh, the, the 261 million, which, came, which is CARES 2, has, is pretty much exhausted. That was largely used to do all the all of the uh, testing and contracting with various laboratories and some enhancements of our own laboratory, as well as uh, bringing on additional epidemiologists, as well as bringing on additional contact tracers. Uh, we were able to ramp up the staff capacity up to about 1,500 statewide contact tracers, which was incredibly important and continues to be important as we identify uh, some of the variants uh, that are more easily transmissible. Five at this point have been identified, or five cases, same variant in, among five different individuals. And so the contact tracing is being paid for by that. Um, but the CARES 1 and CARES 2 basically are already exhausted. And so the budget period, although it could have been through next year, is, is um, almost irrelevant at this point. We just got uh, funding. We're currently writing the, uh, the budget plan uh, for the CARES 3. We hope that that will begin to help us uh, really have an improved surveillance system. I think I've, I've said to you many, many times that one of the lessons I learned is that an underfunded public health is not able to respond to a pandemic effectively because the infrastructure, whether in trained staff or in uh, IT capacity is simply not there. And that's what we found with our existing software that supported both disease surveillance, but also our vaccine management system. And I can talk more about that in, in a minute. But our vaccine management system called GRITS, not like the, the food we all love, but it actually stands for our Georgia Registry of Immunization Transactions, you know, maybe is about 15 years old, maybe a, a little uh, um, older, but it simply does not have the capacity to deal with hundreds of thousands of cases. Um, that, and, and thousands and thousands of millions, frankly, of, of doses of, of um, vaccine with the granularity that we need to do the reporting that we need to do. And we're in the process of, of making some enhancements to that, even as we hope in the days ahead to shift to uh, um, more updated uh, 21st century system. The um, early influenza season and COVID-19 vaccine preparedness funds were CDC funds that came directly to us as, the, as we were asked to begin the vaccine um, planning, developing our, our plan that was submitted to CDC in October and also allowed us to use our 
influenza program as a demonstration project for how we would do mass uh, vaccinations. And, and so much of the early work, including um, hiring of additional staff came out of that grant, which we have nearly exhausted as well. But we had got additional vaccine preparedness funds um, as well. And that's uh, the 95, um, almost $96 million um, that will, is additional CDC funds to support overall the vaccine preparedness for staff, for, um, we hope to help enhance also our, this infrastructure for vaccine allocation, monitoring and reporting, as well as other, uh, other aspects, including improved communication to providers as well as the public, because this changes so rapidly. Um, just to, very quickly, the 21,666,345, that's the FEP grant, that's a public health emergency preparedness grant. Uh, that is what we use when we respond to hurricanes, when we respond to any emergency event. In this case, we use much of that grant actually to support our efforts around COVID response, including uh, renting hotel space to be able to house isolation and quarantine um, individuals, uh, and also having special trailers that we purchased and were available at, at uh, the Georgia Public Safety Training Center. We're around the state, we had individuals who needed to isolate with infection, but didn't have the kind of home situation where they could actually get um, to be away from other people. And so a surprising number of activities, um, everything, like I said, from housing of, of homeless to um, housing of, for isolation or quarantine, for transport, for EMS transport and other things, uh, were, were funded out of that grant. Uh, as well, and, and which is about to end. Uh, we got a, a various other um, grants, uh, some federal monies uh, through various other programs, including some special projects to be able to work to help ensure um, the safety of, of the airline industry during this time. Um, but we are, uh, that is, is actually this that number 14,987 actually represents a whole uh, list of other smaller grants. Ryan White even got some additional um, monies to have special outreach to individuals with HIV and, and do prevention efforts. And I can provide you with that list, that itemized list of exactly. It, because there's a lot of little grants that added up to what seemed like a lot, but again, wasn't. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at Will to mm -hmm. get that to you um, as soon as we finish up. Um, and then, as I said, the Corona Relief, the large uh, amount of funds that came to uh, the state, we got uh, kind of some starter funds from that before we were uh, switched over to the direct funded um, CDC funds, and that's that's our budget. There's no uh, there's no uh, request specifically at this time uh, for uh, for the amended budget, and we are, as I said, working pretty much on federal funding for our work with uh, on COVID. And, and let, let me stop here and just uh, ask any, if you have any questions about the budget. And before I launch into some follow up on the. Great. On the thank, thank you, Dr. Toomey. I, I think we do have several with questions. And the first person we had on our list was uh, Representative Hughley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and thank you, Dr. Toomey, for your uh, presentation. Um, I am being inundated with uh, elderly uh, citizens who cannot get the appointments for the vaccine. The phone lines are, are overwhelmed and uh, I, I got a 85 and a 90 year old who cannot go online and 
register. So what, what shall I tell them to do? No, thank you. I, I, um, I am very much not only aware of this, but I'm personally getting hundreds of emails a day. Um, and I recognize that there's a challenge we have, as do all states, that there's limited vaccine supply and a population that, uh, that has been identified as our, uh, our target group that we want to vaccinate, those highest risk, mm -hmm. um, and that's the 65 and older, um, both in nursing homes and out of nursing homes. Let me say a couple of things. The vaccine supply is a fully federally funded, fully logistics handled by the federal government. Um, we, we don't make, we, we can tell them where to send the vaccine, but we don't make the decision. And believe it or not, what we've been told about our allocation actually changes week to week. Um, and it's very hard to make long-term plans. Uh, and so that's been a real challenge, not just for us, but um, for all of the states. And, and I am on calls, you know, several times a week with my colleagues in other states. We're all, you know, dealing with the same issues and the same problems. What have been scheduling systems that work very adequately for, um, for the testing simply couldn't sustain the kind of extraordinary demand. And, and Representative Hubley, I'm in, I'm in contact with Dr. Townsend almost daily, so I'm, I'm well aware of the challenges there in terms of, of capacity and we're working with her. And as we are working statewide, because we don't have a, a single scheduling system, which has made it difficult because there's a different way to schedule in Columbus than there is in Fulton County than there is in Rome. And we are working in the next weeks uh, to have a single scheduling system that will be consistent, which I think will be, we are asking the health directors to please um, support this single system. Um, but, but going back to vaccine supply, um, we have been getting, because a vaccine was taken off the top of our allocation, and that was a decision that the long-term care facilities made and we supported. They wanted CVS and Walgreens to come in and vaccinate them, and that was fine by our, um, our assessment because that took one more activity off our plate, but it, by doing that, um, as much as 40,000 doses were taken off the top of our allocation, an allocation that's, that seemed to change um, a little bit uh, week to week anyway. And so uh, if for the last several weeks, our allocation was only about 80,000 a week. It's now with the culmination of at least part of that uh, Walgreens CVS program, we're now getting 100,000 uh, we would all start to get this week 100,000 doses a week, but that's very, very little vaccine to support the kind of demand and need we have for um, this population. And so we're hoping that we can uh, continue to expand, uh, particularly as more vaccine becomes available. We have told, we have been told uh, that the new administration will be planning to provide more vaccine uh, very, very rapidly. But I, none of us know and uh, how quickly that vaccine pr production can safely ramp up and how quickly we will get it. So in the next week or two, at least, we are going to have to make do with what we have which it appears will have to cover both for first and second doses for those individuals who may have gotten their first dose but still need their second dose. Uh, we have been told that second doses are being held and will be, will be shipped to us initially automatically and then on request later we were told. But in fact, there were no vaccine doses being held. So we kind of are, we have a flat allocation all that, I'm not, I'm not making excuses. I, I think the fact that people can't schedule uh, reflects the incredible demand and the, the relatively low 
allocation. And, and quite frankly, adding providers at this point isn't going to help us because we don't have vaccine to give them. We have been able to have um, some large, uh, what, what I call large vaccine um, events. Uh, uh, and I think that that will be helpful and certainly helpful for healthcare workers who are able-bodied, but you are absolutely right, Representative. You know, our, you know, my elderly mother would not have been able to navigate a large line in Mercedes-Benz Stadium. And we are actually actively looking, particularly for those homebound, because there are many elderly individuals who are homebound. We are actually actively looking to how we can uh, work with visiting nurses or other um, home health care agencies to not only identify you know, who, where these individuals are, perhaps on a registry of Meals on Wheels or some other uh, way to, re to identify them, but also reach out to them you know, through these other home health agencies so that they don't have to try to navigate. But all that is gonna be dependent on additional vaccine. Um, I, I know that that isn't a full answer to your question. I think I know that um, Dr. Townsend and your district is working tirelessly to uh, ensure that every call is answered and that individuals get scheduled as quickly as possible. Uh, but the demand has just far exceeded anything we had anticipated and certainly exceeded the relatively limited uh, amount of vaccine that we were initially allocated. And we are just so hopeful that we will be getting additional vaccine, at which point we can bring on additional providers. We have right now about 400 providers who are active and who have at least at some point gotten vaccine, but we have 1,600, over 1,600 providers registered. But I am reluctant to send them vaccine until we know that we have, a, we have reached a cadence of regular vaccine shipments and that may not happen into several weeks into the new federal administration. This is a federal program. You know, the rules are, are made by the federal program and it's, it's, it's it has led to, uh, I think some challenges for us. Um, I, I do want to say that the part controlled by us were our, was our registry and it really was I, <laughs> within a, a few days of, of actually beginning the uh, vaccination program, we realized it wasn't going to uh, be sufficiently um, robust to be able to handle this kind of volume. It works great, it worked beautifully. Many of you, um, you know, have, have gone to a pediatrician and have seen them use you know, the grits for your, the, their, your children or grandchildren's vaccines, but for the volume, uh, and the magnitude of this, it just wasn't able, it, it doesn't have the granularity and it, it is so labor intensive to enter the data. We are, as I said, actively working to streamline this as quickly as possible and providers are applauding that because I think that has been some of the frustration they've had as well. I wanna just also mention um, to all of you that our numbers look low, but in fact, we have really virtually exhausted our vaccine. What, what has happened, and for reasons that are unclear, um, the CDC website, which is um, allegedly reporting um, the nationwide vaccine coverage, had uh, not reported our numbers accurately, and they had held us at a few hundred thousand, even as we've moved up to 552,558 doses as at 10 o'clock this morning administered. And uh, we had staff working directly with CDC to, to try to figure that out. And I'm, we're still not sure if it was something about our registry not talking to the CDC software or some other glitch, um, but that has, been, um, that has been fixed. But if you look the most accurate place to go for where we are going uh, as a state is our own website on our, our homepage, our DPH website. And the other thing that's, I think, confusing is it looks like, well, you got over a million doses of vaccine. Where are they all? If, they're, if, it, if you've only given half a million or 600,000 doses, 
And what happens is when the vaccine is shipped, it's shipped by the, through the federal system, either directly from Pfizer or um, through the, the um, shipper that works with CDC and then goes directly to the providers. So we don't have to worry about that. We don't have to engage state control or UPS or FedEx ourselves. They are doing that directly to the providers. Um, and, and this is the way other vaccines had been shipped from CDC before, but again, the volume uh, is, is really high. But that they say that we have been shipped these um, vaccines, but the transport of the vaccines may take three days. And so there's a lag before we actually, the provider, whether it's one of our health departments, all virtually all of which are uh, able to vaccinate, or the uh, other private sector providers, including we have added many pharmacies, Kroger, Publix, Ingalls, even, even Walgreens uh, and Walmarts actually, Walmarts and, and many parts of rural areas. And so you know, many, many of these providers don't wanna start scheduling and certainly making long-term plans until they are absolutely assured that the vaccine is, is coming uh, because of the concern that they'll have people scheduled and then have to turn them away, which actually has happened when the vaccine shipment was lower than we had anticipated, sometimes off by a factor of 50%. Um, so that leads to some of that um, imbalance of what appears like we're sitting on vaccine when in fact um, it's vaccine uh, either on its way to us or being held for uh, scheduled appointments. I also wanted to make clear, because this is something we briefly talked about um, at the earlier hearing, is that uh, we have been working very diligently on expanding what providers can give vaccinations, because there were limitations um, in the system that I wasn't even fully aware of until this weekend um, when I was contacted to look into it. And, and, and then I as we looked into it, I mean, there were so many limitations that would have made it difficult, not only for private providers to be able to vaccinate more, with more impact to the community, but even within our own health departments, that it required, for example, that LPNs have a, a nurse with them. Well, then that means the Chatham County Health Departments in there maybe three buildings can only vaccinate one, one building at a time because that nurse there's only one nurse in many LPNs. And so we are hoping that uh, an executive order will be coming soon that expands the ability of LPNs, medi uh, medical um, assistants, right, medical assistants, I was going to say MAs, medical assistants, and PAs to, to function with off site supervision to be able to vaccinate. And that's a tremendous step forward for us as a state because it will add a significant number of, of uh, professionals who right now are ready, willing, and able uh, to provide vaccine in communities. We have also engaged all of our university systems, and many have, have been able to deliver a lot of um, students, both med students, nursing students, pharmacy students, and just other general students to help with administrative aspects of, of um, vaccination um, uh, events. And so I, I, this has been a very, very successful partnership with Mercer, with Emory, with AU, and other, other universities throughout the state. Uh, so uh, Representative Hughley, I didn't make, gave you much more information than you asked for, but um, well, I- thank, thank you uh, for your, uh, your answer. Uh, but my primary concern is, what do what do 90 year olds do to overcome the technological challenge? What do you have in place to help them when you can't get through on the phone? They're 90 years old, so their email address is their phone number. Right. Uh, and uh, because of the pandemic, they're isolated. Uh, and so, you know, they're, they, they're not going to church to their uh, other little social circles where somebody could help them. So what do we have in place to bridge that gap is, 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 my, is my concern because under normal circumstances, they 
they would be able to get help in the community, but because of the isolation associated with this COVID uh, pandemic, uh, it creates a dip, another challenge for them. And so I was just wondering if as a state, we were, we were gonna put something in place to help them. No, as a, as a state, we hope that consistently across all districts that it won't require uh, a registration online, but uh, you can register by phone. But someone who's 85 and homebound, you know, we will be able to roll out what I hope will be an active partnership with home health care providers as well, because I would see an individual like you're describing um, being able to get vaccinated in their own home without having to come out um, with their walker <laughs> to be in a line. I think that was one of the most heartbreaking pictures I've ever seen is individuals lined up outside a, a, a Florida facility with their walkers and wheelchairs. You know, we don't want that in Georgia. We want to make it as simple as possible. <coughs> and so there, and whether they have relatives who can help them or not, there would be a, a phone line that, that they could contact and we'll have that up soon. But as well as, uh, we're working out the details of what is a home um, health care plan. And some, some counties are already doing that. Fulton has actually already uh, set something up with some a, a partnership with other providers. So um, yeah, I, I believe me, I, I truly recognize the challenge and if, uh, actually um, see so many questions like this, it's heartbreaking and I know. And I think when we get um, more vaccine and more availability and more flexibility in how we can provide, it's certainly going to make it easier. The um, I, I think at uh, at every level there was uh, you know a disappointment in the way vaccine has rolled out, and we're hoping that we can uh, reset everything as new vaccines become uh, more more reliably available in the weeks ahead. And I'll, I'll certainly keep you informed as we get additional information. We've gotten no new information yet, other than there's going to be a change at the federal level, but we don't. Um, thank, you know. thank you, Dr. Timmy. We've got a couple of other questions, so let's move along. And if we have some time left, we'll try to double back if we have some other questions from the same uh, representatives. Uh, Representative uh, Chairman Hawkins has a question for you. Yes, sir. Lee, are you there? Can you hear me now? Yeah, now we got yes. you. Go ahead. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, you have mentioned twice about restructuring uh, uh, DPH, and I hope that's something we can look at in the future once we get over this pandemic load. It's, you know, it's apparent that we need to think of in, in those, those lines. But my question is this. I, I was vaccinated uh, last Monday, Monday week, I was told that I had to be back by 12 o'clock on Friday the 29th because they closed at 12 o'clock. Now, I don't know if they meant they closed uh, the public health there in District 2 in Gainesville or they quit giving the vaccinations at 12 o'clock. But I hope that, that this is not the case, especially throughout the state. Uh, you know, we, we really need the accessibility to those offices, especially on the second vaccinations. Can you speak to that? No, I, I'm very, I'm actually aware of this very issue in that very district. Um, and I, I, I know that the intention is to ensure that there, these facilities are open and have, have the doses in hand to be able to give the second, uh, second shots. I know there's tremendous concern about that as well. And I, I will, um, you're the second representative that's, uh, express concern about that particular district's uh, hours, and I will pass that along to the health director. Because I, I think at this well, point in time, you know, I, no, I, I'm, I, now I know you're not trying to get anybody into trouble, but I want, to, I want to say that I just feel very strongly, it's all hands on deck, but also we need to really think outside the box about how we're doing this. And I, I, I know that they are really stretched to the max in your district, not only be, giving vaccines, 
the, the numbers of cases in your district are extraordinarily high. Right. And so they're, they're also doing, um, you know, an enormously impressive effort in trying to uh, do to continue to do the mitigation work that we do in public health, including contact tracing where possible. So I, I, I'm, I'm aware of this issue and, and we have, we've been meeting two or three times a week with the health directors over um, through Zoom and we will continue. I will actually bring this up tomorrow um, because this well, is space is an issue, but I appreciate you raising the issue and um, I, I share your concerns and we will look at this. Can I ask, add just one more thing? Um, I, I was asked at the big hearing, I don't know if um, you were all there about morale. And I do know morale in public health is, is challenged. I think uh, we are, have all worked 24 seven in many cases um, for over a year. And um, it's, it's been difficult. I know that um, many individuals who worked in public health in the counties didn't expect to sign up for this kind of uh, uh, experience. This is a once in a lifetime pandemic for all of us in public health. And I, I, I really have been urging and encouraging all of our staff, regardless of where they sit to really rise to the challenge. This is public health time. We have to, this is the time we have to be there. But the other thing is, Boy, it's just it's so nice to get a thank you. And, and I think I, I hear again and again from County Public Health that they get a lot of angry emails and, and angry phone calls. And, and I, as I've said to some of you privately, social media has been the biggest detriment to, to employee morale than anything because it's easy to tweet out, um, you know, that health department is, you know, or don't know what they're doing. And so seldom do you get a tweet. Boy, I really appreciated that um, how getting that vaccine today. And if you are in the your health departments at home, please please thank the staff. I mean, it means so much, even more than the overtime they're being paid, and they are getting overtime pay um, uh, or comp time. I mean, that that thank you is so meaningful. I will say this, that your staff could not have been more professional or pleasant to deal with in District 2. I was uh, very happy with, with uh, my visit. Uh, and I can call Dr. Taylor, the director, myself about that time issue. But but thank you so much for what y'all are doing. Appreciate and, it. And it's, it's really a team effort. I mean, this is all of us statewide working together. So I thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Toomey and uh, Representative Hawkins. Debbie Buckner has a question for you, Dr. Toomey. Great, thank you. Well, as a former public health worker, thank you all from the top to the bottom. I know it's all hands on deck and I appreciate what you've done. I received a question from a local pharmacist who I'm, I'm also proud of. He's one of the um, Good Neighbor Pharmacy Network and didn't have vaccines, but he's been sharing with his customers where vaccines are available on a on it as he finds out basis and has and it's been really nice for him to do that referral but he had a question um and so did another pharmacist that works for one of the big chain pharmacies that they think if they had the vaccine it would be so much safer for some of the elderly patients to be able to do drive-in vaccines, even if they have to park the cars and wait the 15 minutes and check on them. And, and they've been told that that is not allowed by Georgia law. And I was trying to determine if that is the case and if that's something that we could address to make access easier. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll ask Megan to answer that because we, we had allowed, we had tried to expand drive-in, many drive-in activities, particularly uh, for, for flu as well. Um, but it also to make sure that your pharmacist knows about the vaccine locator tool that is now on our website. This is our DPH website um, because it has locations where vaccine is currently available as well as pharmacies and uh, grocery stores. So I just want to put a plug in there because that's something to share with your constituents. It's 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 been on, only up for a week, and it's been invaluable to be able to direct people to sites other than just public health um, that 
as you all have pointed out, has been uh, inundated with calls. Yeah. Hey, Representative Buckner, this is Megan Andrews with DPH. I'm the Director of Government Relations. Um, we have been looking at that code section. Um, there is an exception if um, the vaccine is related to a um, state of emergency, then drive throughs are allowed. Um, I am in the process of um, having a bill drafted with legislative council that will lift um, some of the burdens that we've seen in the way Georgia law is drafted with um, regard to a vaccine um, campaign of this nature. So that will be dropped um, very soon, I hope, and I'm looking forward to your support on that. Thank you. I should have known y'all would be on top of it. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's you no, know, my, our goal is to get vaccine and everyone we can. The other thing that you could help us with is uh, the vaccine. I don't know if I should call it hesitancy or just people being afraid of the vaccine or, or um, you know, kind of uh, not really trusting that the vaccine is safe or and effective. And this was particularly, I know, uh, Representative Buckner, you as a public health person would be surprised. This is true among our own staff. Only about 30% of our own staff in many of our health departments did not uh, wanted to be vaccinated, which meant 70% did not. The same was true in hospitals. Um, I, yesterday, I was talking to someone at Piedmont, and they said only about, this is in Atlanta, only about 30% of their staff chose to be vaccinated. I mean, so there's, uh, and that's what's so refreshing in some ways. I mean, the bad news is that we don't have enough capacity right now for the older adults, but we had so little uptake among healthcare workers that it was frankly to me uh, disappointing because of, not only because you know they are at high risk to acquire COVID, but that they serve as role models in the community. And if your own doctor or your own nurse or your sister or your cousin who's a nurse's aide or a, a staff at a hospital say, well, I wouldn't get that. Um, uh, I think that that sets a tone of, of distrust that, you know, makes it even harder for us to get the kind of support we want across all Georgia. Um, many of us as old as I am remember the polio campaigns, and so we were, you know, couldn't wait to get our vaccine, but, you know, younger individuals more have skepticism, and there certainly is an active um, kind of anti-vaccination um, Kind of, uh, you know, ideas that have, have permeated public health, not just for this vaccine, but others, including measles. So, I, I you know, I really would welcome your um, thoughts about that and, and how we can uh, even use your influences to help us do a better job to get beyond the misinformation. We're planning some, um, you know, large PSAs and particularly some. Um, with a special focus on the highest risk communities, particularly communities of color, because I think that um, that's, those are communities that we really are anxious to uh, dispel any notion of, of um, lack of safety and efficacy. Well, I can tell you that today, um, my sister and my 97 year old mother and my husband all were vaccinated. <laughs> They got their first dose today. So my family that's, is taken great. care of as I can do for the categories at the point at this moment. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you. Now, Timmy, I had a couple of questions for you. Uh, I think that I heard you say that really the state has either none or very little say about the amount of vaccine that goes into the program I guess it was warp speed or whatever it was that goes to the long-term care facilities. Is, is that right? No, that's absolutely right. I mean, our allocation was was defined at the federal level and with the um, uh, long-term care facility program uh, taking vaccine off the top, as I said, I we didn't, uh, we weren't unhappy about that because that allowed them to be vaccinated, the long-term care facilities and and their staff to be uh, vaccinated first, um, even as we move to our, our healthcare workers. 
but, but there was so not the full allocation of vaccine came to us and there's still um, this week still there's uh, still some being pulled uh, out for that and I think that will end and then but even then our full allocation as I understand it is only going to be about 120,000 a week which isn't very much if you want to set up a uh, say a large scale a vaccine clinic in Rome and in uh, South Georgia and uh, Metro Atlanta and Athens, you know, you'll quickly run through that vaccine as you run people through and meanwhile have uh, home health care agencies vaccinating elderly at home. You know, that's that doesn't go very far. And, and, and uh, I am, you know, as I say, I, I don't know what the new administration has planned. I don't know how you can really rush vaccine manufacture safely, but we're hoping that the allocations will come quicker um, in greater quantity and with a cadence we could count on because at this point it was from week to week, we didn't even know what exactly was going to be there for us. And sometimes it was only half of what we had anticipated. Right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Timmy. I think one thing that has come to my attention, it seems that the bottleneck in the system of getting vaccine into the arm seems to be the fact of the short supply of the uh, vaccine. If we had a larger supply of vaccine, I think you'd see our numbers go up dramatically. But uh, I, I want to thank you and your team. I know that y'all are not working nine to five every day. I know you're working around the clock and on weekends too. I can attest to some of that because of the conversations we had. But one thing I think would be helpful, Dr. Toomey, is if there's a way that we can find, if you can find out when you're going to receive a shipment and how many, and then when that's going out to the local providers so that they can plan their uh, days to do mass vaccinations and so forth and they can make sure they get their people in there it may be something that's very hard to do but if 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 that could become a reality i think the scheduling and the planning would make it easier and more effective and hopefully we'd never have a dose that went unused oh i absolutely agree i mean a hundred percent in fact we had that conversation this morning and and we're hoping that with uh you know, updated technology to manage the vaccine, uh, that the providers will have that granularity, even where exactly their uh, shipment is and when they can expect it. And I, I agree with you. And, and as recently as an hour and a half ago, we were having this same conversation. Right. Well, now to me, to your team again, please say thank you to all of them for us and for what you all are doing to help. And uh, we're going to close out this section of it. We have some other folks that want to visit with us uh, through uh, Zoom here. So thank you again. And we'll move on to uh, uh, Commissioner Frank Berry. Thank you so much. And a shout out to Commissioner Berry for all his support for our work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you Dr. Toomey for all that you're doing and Chairman Parrish, uh, again, want to recognize you for reaching out throughout the last 10 months to the department. Uh, it really has meant a tremendous amount and uh, Representative Buckner, uh, thank you for joining. It's a great committee um, uh, led by, by Chairman Parrish, but a super, super committee and one that we've had great dialogue on for several years and um, meet uh, whenever you're ready. Uh, I know we have worked together for many years in a variety of different settings, but look forward to uh, Brandy maybe reaching out to you and scheduling some time uh, to get you a little bit more information uh, about our department as a whole. And if you'd like to do that, we certainly can, can offer that. And uh, Mr. Chairman, again, and to the members of the committee, thank you. We went over a pretty comprehensive overview this morning I uh, just want to remind everybody, we are the regulatory compliance and finance branch of healthcare in Georgia. Uh, and again, we'd be happy to schedule time to go into great detail about what that means. Uh, but in essence, just from a big standpoint, we rely on the other departments that do direct care to tell us what they need. Uh, and we figure out ways to either one, make that our term medicatable. Uh, if that's a defect situation where Tom says, this is the best service that we want to offer for our kids. And is there a way for Medicaid to pay for some of those costs? 
we do the due diligence and work with CMS and work with his department to see if that's a possibility. Um, we also work with the Department of uh, Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities on the same approach. So we rely on those other departments and their subject matter expertise to help inform the direction that the department goes as it relates to Medicaid and waivers and things like that. Um, again, went over a tremendous amount of detail this morning. Uh, we can get right into the budget. I want to be sensitive to your time, but then we are prepared to stay and answer for as long as you would like, uh, uh, whatever questions you may have. So we'll get right into the budget. Uh, right, Lisa, Commissioner, I'll, please, yes, please just go ahead with the budget, and then when you finish your presentation, if we have questions, we'll take those in, please. Great. Lisa, turn it right over to you. Thank you, Chairman Parrish. I'll start with uh, the amended fiscal year budget, and I go through the budget programmatically as it relates to Department of Community Health. And I start with departmental administration and what you're seeing some of our budgets are some transfers. And I'll uh, go through those kind of quickly and just touch on some of the base, uh, some of the uh, new funding or uh, growth funding that's coming into our budget for the amended fiscal, fiscal year. I'll start with uh, the first being a transfer within the department administration. The transfer is $850,000 being transferred into the departmental administration from age, blind, and disabled. And that transfer will help uh, with the, uh, I would say help control the cost of the increasing uh, lab Tory services that had occurred in uh, the benefits program. And the reason it's being transferred to administration is to help with prior authorization as it relates to uh, laboratory services being conducted within the benefits program. The next item uh, that we have is uh, funding related to the Patients First Act, and that's $1.8 million related to the Patients First Act, and that's to help with some of the implementation and continuing operation once the Patients First become uh, implemented on July 1 of 2021 of this year and that will help with some uh, Medicaid staffing needs, some of the contractual services related to monitoring and managing uh, patients first. The additional funding for that will be in the Department of uh, Human Services in which they have partial funding in their budget related to patients first staff. The next item is uh, just a yes item saying that we will uh, review and explore therapeutic services related to foster care children and those children who are in joint custody between DFACS and DJJ. And we're working with the Department of Human Services as it relate to uh, a model and methodology related to therapeutic foster care. The next item is to provide funds for all peer claims database and that's 750,000 that's been added in the amended year to continue the implementation of an all peer claims database uh, to enable uh, analysis and public reporting related to healthcare costs. And once again, that's $750,000. The next slide, is, we'll go into our healthcare and facility regulation program. And also in the healthcare facility regulation program is a transfer from the age blind and disabled program of $2.4 million. And that transfer will help with the infectious uh, surveys within healthcare facility regulation. And that's just a one-time transfer so that we can meet the mandates of the infection surveys. And that work actually began in the spring of last year. And this will help with the cost for the initiation of those surveys back during the spring. The next item is $4.8 million to be included in healthcare facility regulations budget to help for contractual services to help with uh, maintaining some of the backlog as it relates to surveys. And that $4.8 million that you see is a bigger proposal that we had submitted to OPB. And I think those documents has been submitted to both the House and Senate budget offices as it relates to uh, dealing with some of the issues that were occurring within healthcare facility regulations related to the surveys and the turnover of surveyors and uh, to help maintain and structurally align that program for stabilization. The next item is in Indigent Care Trust Fund. The $35.7 million in Indigent Care Trust Fund is our annual ask for um, state funds to help support the private DISH program. 
and private dish is the mat that state funds is to match the drawdown for the federal within uh, private hospitals for indigent care uh, patients. The next program is in our benefits program. And that's a combination of our age, blind and disabled and low income Medicaid and Peach Care for Kids program. And the first item is our usual ask for growth. And that growth is uh, an ask of a reduction of $26.8 million in our benefits program. But that growth re represents uh, the summary of the uh, benefits ask for age blind and disabled, low income Medicaid and peach care. So the real reduction that is actually occurring in the benefits program is in age blind and disabled, but there is an increase in terms related to growth in low income Medicaid and peach care for kids mm -hmm. as it relates to uh, enrollees within the benefits program. The next item is for our dual eligibles is uh, for the increase in the Part B premiums. We assist in the premium uh, payment for those dual eligibles and that's an ask of $1.2 million for those dual eligibles and that's in the age uh, blind and disabled program. The next item is to reflect Part D clawback as it relates to the CARES Act. The enhanced rate of 6.2 and additional federal funds allow for a reduction in state funds that matched the federal, and that's a reduction of $26.1 million for the Part D claw clawback, and that's related to du the dual eligibles also in terms of their pre prescription assistance. The next item is the transfer out of age blind and disabled that I spoke about related to uh, that funding going into departmental administration. The next item is also in our benefits program, and that's actually a reduction of $344 million related to the enhanced FMAP savings that uh, came as a result of the CARES Act in terms of an enhanced percentage of 6.2 for the federal drawdown. And this is the reduction related to the state share. The next item is $2.4 million reduction, and that's to transfer out of age blind and disabled to a healthcare facility regulation to help with the uh, infection surveys in the, for our healthcare facility regulation. The next two items are actually like revenue items that we provide revenue estimates to OPB annually in August. And this is actually uh, replacing uh, state funds with the nursing home provider fee, and we're also replacing state funds with the hospital provider fee. And it's $101,000 for nursing home and $295,000 for hospital provider fee. It's a fund source slot. That ends our regular administration and operation related to our Medicaid related programs, both administratively and benefits wise. The next is a financial overview of the state health benefit plan. And we usually give a financial status in terms of the position of the state health benefit plan based on our last fiscal year audited, audited fiscal year and our current projected year and two additional projected out years. And as you can see related to revenue and expenditures, we ended the fiscal year 2020 with a surplus of funds within state health benefit plan. However, uh, projected for this year and the two following years, uh, projected deficit and that deficit is related to revenue versus the expense coming into the program. And our revenue has remained constant within state health benefit program. We had a slight increase in terms of employee premiums related to uh, the revenue going into state health benefit plan, but the biggest generator of revenue within the plan is the employer share. And that's usually based on percent of uh, payroll as it relates to uh, each state agency paying into the plan related to their employees. And I also wanted to touch on the prior year fund balance that you see. The prior year fund balance that you see is a fund balance related to OPEB, 
which is OPEP funding based on po post-employee benefits re related to retirees, and also a uh, reserve fund based on state health benefit active employees. But the combined reserve fund, as you see in the current year is projected to be 3.1 billion, and that is ex uh, expected to uh, dwindle down uh, the next two fiscal years based on we might have to use the SHBP reserve to help fund some of the expenditures uh, that are generated within the uh, state health benefit plan. And Chairman Parrish, that ends the budget presentation as it relates to Department of Community Health and we are open for any questions that you might have. Thank you, Lisa. Mm -hmm. Very good, <clears throat> Lisa, thank you very much. Let's see, do we have any members of the committee have questions? At least you must have done a good job. Nobody has a question. For you. <laughs> no. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank we're going to be moving along and I'm, we'll continue to be in touch with you, uh, with Tara and our budget office, just like we have in the past. And we'll work together to get through this. Thank so you. thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you also. Uh, next, we're going to hear from uh, Liz Atkins in the uh, Trauma Care Network Commission. Okay, can you hear me, Chairman Parrish? Yes, we can, Liz. Please go ahead. Thank you, sir. Um, and thank you for having us come present today. And thank you to you and the subcommittee for the difficult work you're doing under very uh, challenging circumstances. Um, I've just shared my screen and hopefully you and the rest of the subcommittee members are able to see that. Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, so this is just a one pager. I'll be uh, very brief here. Um, the governor's uh, recommendation for this amended uh, fiscal year was uh, just over 9 million. And um, the commission's plan uh, with those funds is primarily to shore up the trauma center and emergency medical services distributions to essentially restore them to the 2018, 2019, and 2020 uh, funding levels. Um, I know we've heard a lot about COVID, but uh, what we're seeing in our trauma centers right now is unprecedented volume increases, which is kind of counterintuitive to what you would think with folks being uh, sort of sequestered at home for the beginning part of um, last year. But some centers are up uh, over 25% on top of their uh, 2019 volume. So um, it is it is pretty unprecedented. And then several centers are over 20% uh, from their 2019 volume. Um, and we know that trauma centers do treat, do tend to treat those marginalized and underserved patients who were in, indeed the same populations that were very impacted um, by COVID. So, um, so you'll see that uh, 5.5 million and then the 1.3 million at the very bottom would be to, uh, to shore that up. Uh, in addition, one of the trauma commission's commitments was that when funding was available, um, as you all may or may not be aware, um, not all 34 trauma centers in the state are in the funding stream. So one center is a military center, and so it's not eligible for funding as such. But the other 33 centers, only 28 are in the funding stream. So when we are able to get additional amended funds such as this, we bring on the remainder of the other system of the other centers into the system, and that includes three level threes. And uh, the level threes tend to be our more rural centers, um, in addition to a level two and then a, and another pediatric center. So that was uh, that's at about six hundred and sixty nine thousand dollars to bring them on board. And then the remainder of our funding is um, investment in outcomes measures, because we know that um, you want to hear the impact that this funding is making. And so we want to make sure that we are supporting the best available benchmarking uh, health outcomes so we can find out um, what this funding is actually doing and is it improving care? And we wanna be able to show you those measures when we come in and present to both the House and the Senate um, uh, to say what the impact of the funding has been. Um, and that in a nutshell is really what our plan is for the, uh, for the amended recommendation from the governor and I'll open it up for questions. I really don't have anything else uh, to mention. 
Okay, thank you very much, Liz. Do we have any questions from members of the committee? Anybody? Don't, don't see anybody there. Uh, Liz, take just a moment, maybe for somebody who may not quite understand how this funding comes about and explain where you get your funding from as far as the uh, speeder fines and that sort of thing. Thank you very much, Chairman Parrish, of course. I'd be happy to. The uh, predominance of our funding comes from the super speeder collections and fines, uh, reinstatement fees, uh, and that uh, last year was our, around $23 million. So typically our base budget is somewhere around 14 to 15 million. The, the budget this year was 14 million um, as it was last year, as you are well know about the uh, base budget cuts. So the um, only other revenue source for us is the fireworks excise tax revenue. That's come up a little bit uh, since that started just a few years ago. So last year it was about three, just over 300,000. This year it's 458,000. So uh, the balance uh, between the total collections for super speeder and then our base budget um, is 8.6 million uh, that was in the governor's recommendation. That's equal to the balance of what our base budget was. And then when you add the fireworks excise tax revenue, uh, that is where the 9,065,782 comes from. I hope, did that answer your question? I hope. Yes, it does. Thank you. No questions from the committee. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. We look forward to working with you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Parrish. Yeah, this, this concludes our presenters for today. So we're going to be ready to uh, leave this. I'll remind the members of the committee that you should have gotten an email from TAR. So check your email about coming events and uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you. Sorry.